Hey friends, Dean here. Before we get you on to your episode, I want to take a moment to invite you to our next virtual online trivia night. Wednesday, May 13th at 8 p.m. Join us either on our Facebook group or on our YouTube page for three rounds of fun trivia, music questions, movie questions, general knowledge questions. It'll be a fun time and a chance to win some prizes and have just a good relaxing night uh, of some trivia at, at home. You don't even have to go out for it. So don't forget, Wednesday, March 13th at 8 p.m., Join us on our Facebook group or YouTube for three rounds of fun virtual online trivia. We'll see you there. In this episode, we're talking about the breakthrough album from a punk new wave group that spawned their first number one hit. A disco song? Stay with us. Get ready for the 3324 podcast, where lifelong friends Dean Legiro and Eric Coover share their love of all things music and movies. Dean has directed short films and is a music trivia buff. And Eric, trained in audio engineering, brings his extensive knowledge of music and film to the conversation as they discuss, debate, and celebrate their favorite albums, films, and much more. Welcome to the 3324 Podcast. If you are a new listener, welcome. We appreciate you checking us out. We've got a big back catalog for you to dive into, a lot of great stuff there. And if you're returning, welcome back. We are glad that you're with us as well. I'm Dean behind the microphone, and uh, Eric should be somewhere out in the interwebs calling calling to me. <laughs> How you doing, you? Dean? How you doing, Dean? There he is. We we exist virtually. Uh, yes. Is that is that a fair assessment? I, I think so. Yeah. One day we will do this in person, but for now, we are we are using the uh, the wonders of technology. Mm-hmm. And we appreciate you using technology to uh, hit us up on social media. So we've got uh, Instagram and Facebook, and we've made it as easy as possible. We have the same login and the same account name. It's 3324podcast. So if you put that into either one in Instagram or Facebook, you're going to find us there. So that that's our commitment to you is to make it as easy as possible. So all you have to do is go check us out. Go ahead and and, and uh, interact with us there. We do live shows. We do a lot of posting and we have a lot of fun online. So by all means, uh, th- this is not the, the be all and end all. We've got a whole uh, social media arm of our mm-hmm. of our company. <laughs> it's not Can a company. 16 yet. episodes in already, Dean? Yep. 16 episodes 16 in. 16 episodes in. We're, we're not an LLC. So uh, we're not there yet. But maybe, maybe we'll have to brand 3324. So today... We're talking about Blondie and not the the Dagwood Mm. cartoon. We're talking about the group Blondie and their album Parallel Lines. So let's get into this. Let's give you the Mm. the stats like we like to, and then we'll uh, we'll dive in. So this was released in September of 1978. It was their third album. And this one was produced by Mike Chapman, which is kind of important. This is the first time they worked with him. It hit number six on the U.S. charts. Uh, there was a few singles that were released, uh, Hanging on the Telephone, which did not chart one way or another, which hit number 24, and Heart of Glass, which hit number one. And this album was certified platinum, 1.5 million in sales. And I'm sure it's been it's more than that, but back back then, that was its first certification. Mm. Yeah, th- this was preceded so those three, by... Those, so those three, those three were... Those three were hits, right? That you mentioned. Those were hits in the U.S. In the U.K., they released the "Sunday Girl," okay. which did very well. Um, but in the U.S., the, it these was six were these singles three. in all. Because I, I found it interesting uh, because three of the singles came from side one, and then the other three came from side two, which evened it up. It's a twelve-song album, so I, I, I thought that was pretty cool. So, yeah. Sorry to interrupt, but nope. <laughs> no, no, no. No, that's what that's what we're here for is to interrupt yeah. each other. Get yeah. get it. Try. Each of us try to get a word in edgewise. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> last, last man standing. So, uh, yeah, so so th- this was their breakthrough album. Mm. Uh, this was preceded by Plastic Letters, which didn't do a whole lot. Uh, the, you know, they were, uh, Blondie was still firmly entrenched in the new wave slash punk scene. Mm-hmm. So Plastic Letters hit number 72. It actually came out the same year as this. They actually put out two two albums in the same year. Plastic Letters came out mm. in in January. I'm sorry, February of '78, and Parallel Lines <laughs> came out in September. So that's a double whammy. And if you listen to the two albums, if you go back and check out P- Plastic Letters and Parallel Lines, and they both begin with a P, and it's a lot of 
a lot of plosives in the microphone, but um, you'll you'll hear a difference. <laughs> you'll actually you'll absolutely hear oh, a difference in the two. Yeah, and, uh, and not yeah. that there's anything mm -hmm. wrong with plastic letters, but parallel lines was kind of uh, really the the shaping of the Blondie sound and uh, smooth smoothing out mm -hmm. a lot of the rough edges as well. Which was yeah, I think the which, previous was more of their. I think it had more of their punk feel, which, you know, pretty much was what they were doing live, I think. I think it had more of their sort of on stage sound. But yeah, this one definitely was a was a vast difference in production wise. You know, yeah, just production wise. Sort of, I mean the, the big yep. hit off of uh, or from plastic letters was I'm always touched mm -hmm. by your presence, dear, and then mm -hmm. also De uh, Denis, or it's a remake of a of a uh, song called Denise from the sixties. Mm -hmm. Um, th those were the two, but there's a lot of other album tracks like Detroit 442 and, and a couple of other ones that are, are really just rave ups. I mean, the, the, you know, the, the stuff on plastic letters definitely has a different feel and the sound is different. So that actually separates it too. And it's amazing that this happened uh, in the same year that in September, they would come out with something that was really just more refined and more mm -hmm. of a, of a thought of what Blondie should be and, and having Mike Chapman uh, at the boards uh, and you, you know, we say, well, what's a producer do and, and what's the big deal? Well, in this case, it, it really made a, it, it really did make a big deal. Yes. And there's some things I noticed mm -hmm. on, on so the you most recent you, listens. So the uh, production of this album is definitely a big factor. Was it, you know, was, you know, you, so you can agree with that. Right? Oh yeah. And the success yeah. of this album just and, and the success of, of Blondie. Just in terms, because yeah, just in terms of us like loving production and, and, and in that sense, him coming in and, and really fine tuning the band itself. Cause I, I heard he wasn't a big fan of the band. He, he didn't think much of them as musicians. From yeah. What I at understand. the time. So, yeah. And then, uh, so he would go on to work with them again, working with them individually, like one-on-one -on -one and, and, you know, and, and they, there was a lot of hiccups, like they, I guess in the recording of this album. So but yeah, that, they, yeah, but they, it definitely they, they made a difference. Done. Yeah. Yeah. They, 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 they got it done. And this is uh six weeks, right? It took some, uh, they recorded the album in six weeks. Good question. Yeah, Ju uh, June and July. So ba basically, over two, you know, not more than two months. So they really like knocked it out. I mean, that's just crazy for an album that that sounds this produced. Yeah. Um, that usually, usually when stuff takes doesn't take long, it's usually because it's a little bit more raw, a little more exposed mm -hmm. by by choice, not because yeah. they they did it and it just didn't it didn't come out good. But they'll they knock it out going for a sound. So this was the opposite: is is they were going for a sound, um, and and they were able to achieve it quite quickly, quite quickly, which is really awesome. So back in '78, yeah, this 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 album is is kind of what I call one of my foundation albums. I I got into this when it came out. Um, I don't know if my parents gave me the money to buy the cassette or I had some allowance money. It was certainly before I was working as a <laughs> on the books or a taxpayer put it that way. Mm. <laughs> but, but I did get the, I remember I, I did get the cassette and I do remember probably before that. And I may have some of those mixtapes hanging around of, again, we, we, we talked about that. We talked about this with, when we did our queen uh, episode about live aid, about sitting in front of the TV. Well, you know, the first version yes. of that was sitting in front of the radio with your cassette deck that's how you basically quote unquote downloaded music, right? Is, is you waited for it to come on yeah. and you hit, you hit play and That's record right. <laughs> and hopefully you got the full song. If the DJ wasn't talking up into it, uh, that that's how you did it. And, and there was a lot of, I was recording a lot of Blondie stuff at the time. And, uh, and when this album came out, I, I got it on cassette and didn't have a lot of music. So I just listened to what I had and I listened to this endlessly so much that it got caught. It would get caught in the, in, in the cassette deck uh, and, and you know, I'd be pulling it all yeah. out like like spaghetti, and you'd have to rewind it with the pencil. All that right. stuff happened. This, this, rewind it with the pencil. This yep. cassette, <laughs> this cassette was a victim yeah. of that. It, it would get chopped up. I had oh, the cheapest. Boy. You know, I was a kid. I didn't have a great, uh, great electronics or, or anything like that. So um, I, I did the best I could. But it, yeah, would, my it first, would get caught. My first tape recorder. It was an actual tape recorder that you, you didn't necessarily play music. It wasn't meant for music. It was meant for dictation. Mm -hmm. You know, that was my first uh, cassette player, you know, before Walkman's, you know, that is, you know, but yeah, uh, I had, I had one of those too. I had a, yeah. uh, one with a radio, but then I had just a, a, just a cassette player. Yeah. It was like oblong kind of like, you know, right. like a small shoebox 
looking thing. So as, as, and the uh, handle as far back, out. yeah, as far back as I can remember, when I first met you, I think mm -hmm. you were into this album and it meant a lot to you. Is there any other, you know, can you speak to anything else about it that, that, you know, why it's so special? Even after I, all these, I think you know. it's just because it was one of those albums that I did, I had and, and wasn't get, you know, what 78, I was what, probably 79. I, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't think I got it right when it came out, but so we'll say 79. Mm -hmm. So I was like 12, 13, somewhere around there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Still at that age where, where you're not really working yet. So where's your money coming from? Probably some allowance or you get birthday money, this, or the other thing. So I, I remember just, yeah you know, my, either my parents got it or I got it. And it was one of the only cassettes I had. I think I had, I had that cassette at the time, uh, probably some village people. Cause I was getting into vill village people at the time as well, but this was like mm -hmm. the rock music for me. I didn't, I hadn't really gotten into rock yet. And, and I just devoured this and it was, it was my companion when I was, when, when I had no other music to listen to, or wasn't listening to the radio. It was, it was this album it was parallel lines. And when, and when I first started to rebuy vinyl, nice. It's one of the first ones I got. I was like, I, I have to get a really nice copy and I have to hear this album. Uh, and it and it and it still does not disappoint. It is an album that I'm I'm not tired of after all this time. And it, and it was a joy oh, no. and a pleasure to revisit. It's a classic. It's been a it's been a long time. Like the Queen, uh, like the works. It's been a really long time since I listened to Parallel Lines too. Yeah. I can't remember how I was first exposed to it. It might have been. I don't think it was, I don't think it was through you, <laughs> you know, it could have been, I mean, you certainly, certainly when we met, we certainly could, you could have played it yeah, perhaps, but I don't think that was the case. And I, and I just, for the life of me, I can't remember how I, I really got to know the record might've been well, a, a kid that lived on my block. He had a, a massive record collection that mm -hmm. most likely is the case. But, or it could, uh, yeah. it could have been maybe as a result yeah. of something that came out afterwards, like Auto American. Sure. Or, uh, and then I went back and yeah. And then went back because, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, their their follow up, Eat to the Beat, didn't do as well. And then they would come out with Auto American, which had Rapture on it, which was just boom. Yeah. And yep. the Tide is High, which was boom. The, the, it just, they re exploded, which is odd mm -hmm. that they hadn't had an album in between. So, um, but for me, yeah, Parallel Lines is, was such a, it's such an important album for me. It really was back then. I I didn't have much. Uh, there was a lot of records. My sister would listen was listening to stuff. My sister was checking out Elvis and and getting into Bruce Springsteen. And my brother was doing his yeah. thing, Pat Benatar. And I was kind of in the middle, picking up a little bit from my sister, picking up a little bit from my brother. But Blondie was was not from either one of those. That was and I don't know what you. possessed me to get it. Uh, it might have been it might have been Heart of Glass. It might have been one way or another. But it was it just, might have been Debbie Harry herself. <laughs> to, to a, you know what? To, to a lesser extent, because at the time I had a cassette, so I didn't have like a big album with a big picture of her on it. Right. So okay. it wasn't it, it was I, I don't want to say that was the reason because it was also the music. Mm. So it, the, yeah. the what what captured me was just the, a, a lot of things, the, the bass, the drums, her vocals were were unlike yes. anything I had her I hadn't heard at that point a female mm -hmm. uh artist sing like that. Most of the female artists I had heard up to that point was like pop music and mm. you know, Angel of the Morning or or, or the popular stuff. Maybe right. some and, heart and, I mean there was certainly stuff going on. Heart was was big and Benatar and all those other artists sure. were there. But but as far as me getting something and, and purchasing it, this this was a this was it. Well, you come to kind of expect, you know, a lot, uh, kind of the consistency of those of those artists, but Debbie Harry had that, you know, especially on this album, it's so varied. There's such range in her in her vocals on this record. Yeah, she is, does a lot. Yeah, she gets she's know. very underrated. Yeah. I, I yeah. think because of her image, especially back then, someone someone as 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 beautiful as that. We'll we'll just put that out there. Unfortunately, I think people think, well, she's just looks. You know, she's just she's just in the front for her looks, and and that was quite quite the opposite case. Is is she was very underrated, I think, as a vocalist. You think when you think of of female vocalists, I, I'll think of like Ann Wilson, who can just yeah soar soar Belt to the stars with yeah. with her voice, right? Mm -hmm. And and Debbie Harry it doesn't have that range, but she does she she does different things, and and it works within Blondie because 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 of those new wave and those punk roots, she's coming from a different she's coming from a different point of view as well, which is important which is mm -hmm. important. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, and a so, lot yeah, of so Mike Blondie, Chapman, he'd worked with her in a lot of this record too. So, yeah. yeah. 
yep. articulating, and, you know, uh, certain words and phrases and, and finishing a note. You know, a lot of punk artists, they tend to, you know, just sort of shorten, you know, not even not even singing into the mic half the time. <laughs> yeah. You know, but yeah, in this it's, case, it's more you about know, the so. feel than it is about the about the right. performance. So that was that was very important. And the yeah. band is let me get this. Let me get this last piece out. What, what I consider the classic Blondie lineup. It's Debbie Harry on vocals, Chris Stein on guitar, Jimmy Destry on keyboards, Frank Infante on lead guitar, Nigel Harrison, number four. Uh, all time bass yeah, player is, is, is on bass, uh, <laughs> and Clem Burke is on drums. So, so this is the this version of the band is is the first version that appears on they appear on on Parallel Lines for the first time, and that would carry them through Eat to the Beat, uh, Auto American, and The Hunter, and then they would break up after that. So, this is what I consider the the classic lineup of of Blondie. Absolutely, this is like so when you, all the hits um, were happening. So, what's your assessment? then if mike chapman didn't think much of the band what what did you think of the band you know, just i always listening. thought that th that this album sounded like one of the tightest bands ever yeah that's what is, uh, had always enamored me from from when i had had bought it as a kid and was listening to it didn't didn't really know what that meant and then years later i'd listen i'm like wow the, these guys just sound in sync and especially for a the the amount of up tempo stuff on here, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. they, it's 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 executed really great. I just I just love it. I I agree. I totally agree. And but I kind of I I guess when you when, when I read that about um but about Chapman, I cannot kind of understand like he you know him coming from the standpoint of they just want to fool around and you know that kind of thing. It reminds me of like somebody going into the studio and pr trying to produce the Who. Like mm -hmm. trying to say to Keith Moon, you got to play straight. Yeah, to wrangle, to wrangle because, all of them. Because that's not what he does. And in this yeah. case, it's the same with, I think, with with Clem. Mm -hmm. He's, you know, he's that kind of drummer, whereas a lot of fills, a lot of, you know, that oh, kind we'll, of thing. We'll get to that. We'll get to yeah. save, save Clem. So Save Clem Burke. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Save, right. save. Oh, there's a lot. This is, this might be a lot, mostly a lot, about him. <laughs> a lot to say. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so it, again, we, you know, we talk about producers a lot and sometimes it, some bands have a, a clear vision about what they want and, and they understand. And some bands just need that extra helping hand in the studio to, to refine or to help help visualize or, or to, to tell a producer what sound they're looking for. And then the producer can help facilitate that. And I think that's what's mm -hmm. what happened here. The other albums are a little bit raw and, and that was, that's where they're coming from. So there's nothing wrong with that, but that's I think okay. this was the next evolution. Right. I think it's the next evolution. And, right. and it, if they were going to going forward into the eighties, they, I think they would have had to have embraced some sort of, artistry some sort of you know doing something in you know more, more in the studio i think is that's what a lot of other bands were sort of gravitating to at the time too so yeah know. and they were kind of on the you know. they weren't totally punk they certainly weren't like a total punk new york punk band right. yeah like television or any of those other ones so they were closer to what was what when punk was ending and what it was morphing into was new wave yes so they were they were kind of in there although they had started certainly early enough i mean you know they Blondie started like 74, 75, or, or started coming together around then. Certainly, Heart of Glass was written in 75, believe it or not. So that, that song was kicking mm -hmm. around for a while. So, so they, they're, they're, they've been around, and then they went through a couple of lineup changes. But then when you get to Parallel Lines, you've, you've got the bass player, you've got Nigel Harrison in, and adding uh, Jimmy Destry, for the most part, was, was the other part of it. It was basically a, a, a quartet mm -hmm. before. Um, but then they went up to six. So let's jump in. It it starts off. I mean, okay. this this uh, this album just starts off really with hanging on the t uh, hanging on the telephone, which is just an up tempo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it, it sets you up for th for what this album is. This album is is very much an up tempo album, and this is certainly not even the fastest song. There are some other other songs that really really do it, but they just really set you up. And I just love I love how this how this album mm -hmm. starts. It's got the good it's got the guitars, uh, it's it's got the it's got the drums, it's got the bass, it's got everything you need on this. And it's got her yeah, snarly absolutely. voice, which which she then, she kind of uses here and, and in a couple of other uh a couple of other song uh, a couple of other tracks on here, which is it's got like this kind of like it's hard to explain. It's not like it's kind of like a growl she that she's able to do with her voice. 
Um, and and mm-hmm. she she does it on this one and, and a couple of others, a couple of other ones. And, and hanging on the telephone is just great. Just love it, love it, love it. Must be one. It might be one of those tracks where it is a little bit on the you know on the uh, the stuff they were kind of doing before. It's less effects on it, mm-hmm. but you know it does still they they still they're still up in the game here. You know, especially, and it's a great track to start off the album with. Yeah, so. it's got some of those those keyboard uh, synthesizer parts in it too, so it's yeah. a nice balance between mm-hmm. the two. Mm-hmm. Not straight; it's it's got the the straight up rock parts to it, and then they they, they throw in some of the synth synthesizer stuff, which is really nice. Mm-hmm. And then it really gets kicking with one way or another, which everybody knows. That's you know, of the, course, the, yeah. The the second most popular song off this album, and they are they still use it in commercials. I I, I definitely heard it this, <laughs> this year. Absolutely. It's got that crunchy guitar. It's got that riff. Yep. Uh, it's just a great, it, it's just a great song about kind of, you know, stalking somebody. And, uh, and it was based on a real, a real event that happened to Debbie Harry back in the late sixties, early seventies. She had a move because this guy was just kind of stalking her and following her. So um, that that's where it came from is, is that one. And it's just, yeah, you've heard one way or another. We don't need to go too far into that one. The one thing I did notice about this, no. I mean that that song has has a guitar solo on it, but a lot of there's not a lot of soloing in this album, which I've noticed. Oh, very, Mm-mm. there's only a couple of songs that actually have guitar solos as opposed to guitar phrases and guitar riffs that are played throughout, um, which is kind of interesting. You, you mm-hmm. would think for like a, a new wavy or a punk, you know, band with punk roots that they'd really be guitar heavy like that, where they'd just be like doing, cra- trying to do crazy solos and crazy stuff. But no, that it's actually really smart. These songs are, are, are really smartly arranged. No, I think, I think in a lot of the new wave stuff too, I mean, I, you know, especially in a punk punk situation, I think, I think you do hear a lot more rhythm, you know, in a sense, there's, there's very little, you know, there's not a lot of noodle. I mean, it might be some noodling and some, you know, some, you know, maybe extra phrasing here, but those are the bands that I always loved anyway, over a straight, say somebody like the Ramones, for example. Mm-hmm. Okay. That every song basically sounds exactly <laughs> it's the just, same. It's just driving. It, it, especially on that first album. I, I could swear to God that first album is like every song is, is the same song. Yeah. It's just driving um, and chugging. Pretty much all they know how to do. Right. Yeah. So I was always attracted to bands like Blondie and the clash who ended up doing more, Yeah, you know, and the police, you know, they were always doing more than what was, I guess this necessary, you know, necessary for a punk band, mm-hmm. you know, so they weren't considered real punk, mm-hmm. you know, because the, the theory is, is that you don't know, you, you don't have to be good to be punk. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> right? No, it so, just have know, to have that, the you know, emotion and the aesthetic. Yeah, just, and right. The, and the, the, just the, you know, and, yeah. And the, and the, yeah. the, the, the blue je- the, the blue jeans and the leather jacket, which but leads yeah, to, and oddly enough, you, you've got one way or another, which is a kind of a callback and it is another mm-hmm. growly and, and it's got yeah. that crunchy guitar. Mm-hmm. follows up with picture this which is one of my favorites just a beautiful song uh yeah. you it really showcases debbie harry's vocals on this too because she does get a chance mm-hmm. to actually sing as opposed to the first two are kind of more rave ups and and she is growling and mm-hmm. and singing at you as opposed to singing to you uh, and picture this has mm-hmm. that and it's got some great tasty guitar lines they're just playing these riffs behind her just these little guitar lines it's just a really great song and it's one of my favorites. And the way it builds up as it, you know, it amps up towards yeah. the end, it gets, it gets louder and louder and, you know, her vo- vocals just stretch. Yeah. She's very, able, she actually warms it. into just, it. You know. And, and yeah, yeah, you're yeah. right. As, as the, the song progresses, she, she, her, she opens up her vocals a lot more and there's a lot more holding of notes and, and some soaring, which is really nice. And and it really shows mm-hmm. that, that, you know, in the first three songs, you're seeing some, some crunchy, heavy stuff. And then in picture this, it's, not really a ballad it's kind of just up tempo pop song but i love the guitar yeah. i just love the if you listen to yeah, that it's more pop go back and, and just, mm-hmm. just just they're just playing these just tasty guitar lines behind her just these riffs yeah. just not a solo it's just they're playing these lines behind her and it's just really great to listen to and that's the great thing about this album is there's a lot of different things to listen to well there's, you know, you, there's you, some you, great you, harmonizing on guitar in this yeah song. yeah, yeah it, it bears sure. it bears Between like the, repeat the, listens the and then we get into <laughs> there's <laughs> what you don't of like course, this song? what the next one yeah it's probably one of my favorite songs oh, actually because okay. uh, surprise you know not surprising since oh, wow. uh okay so it's uh, it's fade it's fade away and fade radiate. Away, radiate right which so, is a uh, really slow at, uh, if this is the slowest song it's very atmospheric it's right. i don't want to say it's trippy but there my is a kind of thing <laughs> there is a guest star on it and a, a very curious guest star as well yeah robert fripp of king crimson prog 
uh, prog guitar extraordinaire, but he was one of those guitarists that managed to help shape prog rock in the eighties, you know, you know, kind of transform it. And he did very well by, by playing with artists like Bowie and uh, you know, his, uh, the version of King Crimson in the eighties, I thought was probably my favorite lineup Mm. at that point. I really, he's really textured. He's really odd on the guitar. He's got this real kind of like extended noodling going on. Mm -hmm. It goes, it goes from left to right on the song, you know, especially with headphones, it's pretty wild. It's an odd track, which of course, you know, I'm into that kind of stuff. Yeah, anyway. it's very, very trippy, but re- so, r- really atmospheric. Yeah. And again, yeah. just a- another great vocal as well. It's not, a, and that's a testament to Debbie Harry because she's not afraid to go there. She's not afraid yeah. to be a little bit more experimental. Absolutely. In that sense. So, Absolutely. yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, that, and that brings us to uh, Pretty Baby also, mm-hmm. which is just another, it's just an up tempo. Again, another just great vocal performance that's 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 what this album is you're gonna it may get repetitive but this is just really just one great performance after another the whole album bears multiple listens and i mm-hmm. think that's that's the thing about this is you're you're able to kind of listen to her vocals and then you're going to want to go back because you were concentrating on the vocals and say well i want to listen to the guitar now <laughs> yeah no you're right you're right and and, and then and then go back and listen to the to the bass and uh and it is drums yeah and it is refreshing and this was not one of the singles but it's it's nice to go back in these little ditties that not they're not fillers of course there's no, i don't think there's a bad song no. really on this record but it's nice to to revisit those songs and and just be and this is a nice little pop again a nice little pop sort of upbeat thing too and you know it has a really nice double layering on the vocals it has like that sort of yep. like that 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 chorus that comes in and yeah it's it's great it's really great it's some nice stuff it's very like i said there's different things on this record too to to, to chew on it's not yeah. just one thing you know so that's it's in, it's an interesting record too yeah but, and, and the way it's yeah. the way it's arranged too you yeah. know the way the, the 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 tracks are yep are kind of stacked you know you get two you got two really kind of raunchy raunchy songs then you got you know picture this which is kind of a little bit more ballady and a little more poppy and then mm-hmm. fade away and radiate which is just really yeah kind of trippy and then they, they kind of bring you back into poppy and then they bring you back into like the <laughs> into the punky stuff with i know but i don't know which is kind of that yes. it's got that 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 new wavy punk aesthetic too as well and it's got some i, I don't know if it's I, i'm guessing it's chris stein kind of sharing vocals uh there's there's definitely mm-hmm. a guy who's who's kind of ghosting her and, and and singing along with her so you kind of get that yeah. too um and i think that's got a, a guitar solo on it as well but not a lot of soloing uh per se mm. but a lot of guitar work a lot of riffs a lot of a lot of power chords a lot of that great stuff that that puts the bass for, you know like like it's the bass that these songs are built on which is great i think i love it I love the fact that there's not a ton of soloing on this album, that it's just that the songs are constructed and it, and it just, I think it's more, yeah. it's, a, it's a more enjoyable listen, I think, because you, because you can listen to other, other things and, and pick up on other things. Yeah. I mean, but if you do go back and listen to the guitar, there's probably, there's, there's obviously, I think there's a lot more going on with the guitar work than, you know, when, when you say soloing, I understand it's like there's yeah. right in the middle. Oh, there's that doesn't always mean that that's one, to, not to short you know, change solo, but you know, but yeah. not to short change. Right. It's a, to the guitar playing on this record is, is very, very good. Oh, it, yeah. So, it's yeah. awesome. I, yeah. So, to, I'm not trying to by, by any means short change the, what they're doing. I, I, I actually appreciate what they're doing mm-hmm. is that they're using the guitars in a more tasteful way. And, and, and the guitars, the really, you know, are, are kind of there in service of the song and the songs aren't there in service yeah. of the guitars which is what I'm trying to say. Right. Except for Robert right. Fripp. It doesn't feel like, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't feel like, you know, anybody's trying to kind of play over one another. Yeah. It is a very sort of tightly, you know, tight unit and they're all kind of gelling together on this thing. Yeah. Yeah. Now, that, I, and that's I what I love about it. You're right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is, I don't is, know if that's, that's, that's the case live. <laughs> I did see, I did be, see them know. live. I did see them live in 2000, yeah. uh, but not with this, not with this lineup. But yeah, that was always the thing that that really enamored me to this album was just how cohesive it sound. It sounded, even though there's so many so many different things going on, that you could be listening to to the guitar and what they were doing there, and the and the lines and the phrases they were playing. And and we'll we'll save we'll start the Clem Burke conversation on the next song. <laughs> I think it's a I think it's a good place to come in on it. But but there's enough there. And so the next song is 1159, which opens with 
side two, which is two. another. Yeah. Well, I'm, not, I'm just going to comment that it's probably my favorite song on the record. Today. Yeah. No, wow. <laughs> nothing more to say. No, that's, yeah, I, I think so. Why this wasn't a hit, I don't know. It's beyond me because I think, you know, I think it's better than some of the singles that they put out personally, but that's just me. But yeah. I just think it's a great song, you know, and it's, and I love the lyrics too. It speaks to a lot, you know, saying a lot, especially now as, as a couple of middle-aged guys where, you know, <laughs> I think there's, there's some apropos, uh, you know, lyrics going on here that just, we probably didn't notice back then. We didn't care, but mm-hmm. now it's like, so I, I listen to some of the lyrics. I'm like, oof, yeah. you know, let's just, yeah. Yeah. It's just for, for me, this song, um, hi- highlights Clem Burke because Clem, Clem Burke is on another level on this album. <laughs> <laughs> yeah like like really like 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 i the stuff before was was much more subdued and sedate the stuff on on this album and it's one of the things that when now when i thought about it i'm like it was it one of the things was the drumming he is he is so i don't want to say he's out of control um because he's certainly in control and he's driving he's he's literally he is driving every one of these songs mm-hmm. I, I think that's a, a fair assessment. Um, Which is interesting because again, we bring, we keep bringing up Mike Chapman and again, his, his sort of, I don't know, disdain, I guess, for like, you know, why he would say that, you know, he even said that Clem was not a very good drummer. Like he couldn't keep time. Right. That I, that, that blows my mind. I'm like, I, are you if you listen me? to what he's doing on this album, there, there is there's no way he could not be knowing how to keep time. Now is that, you know, you know, is that Mike Chapman's doing? Is I don't it, think so. Is, is, you know, I, I don't think so either. I don't, I don't agree. Think so. it, there, there's hints of it on the previous album. It, it's yeah. there. This is just, I mean, you want to hear a drum, literally, you want to hear a drum clinic? Mm-hmm. Ch- check this album out, because the stuff that Clem Burke does on every single, <laughs> he finds a way to, <laughs> to get fills in on every song, pretty much. That's right. And tight, tight fills with that. Oh, my God. Even. He, even, he Keith, drops, even Keith Moon wasn't tight. I mean, he was sloppy. He was a very sloppy drummer. Yeah, no, this he's guy, the, no, he's got the fills, and he, yeah, he puts them in exactly. He, the he right threads pocket. the needle with some of these yeah. fills. I mean, he's oh, yeah. he, he he's dropping them in mm-hmm. so quickly and getting back out. And and I don't know if I I hope it's not wasn't done in the studio with editing. It doesn't sound like it because I no. if you see him live, he's you know when you see him back then, if you look at clips from back then, he, he's doing the same thing. I don't think so. And he's just absolutely amazing. One of the things I noticed about this song, I I, I don't know if I want to do a count, (laughs) but this is probably the album that has the most amount of crash symbols on it. (laughs) Every song he is just, and the brilliant thing about the production. Yeah. Yeah. He's not subtle. (laughs) Yeah. but, but, But they made it subtle. And that's the thing is if you listen to this album and you listen to Clem Burke, the drums are the actual drum. The snare drums are brought forward, mm-hmm. but and and the ride. So when he hits the ride, the ride it's brought forward. But when he's crashing, the, the you know hitting the crashes, it's actually brought down. It, it, go back and listen to some of these songs, and you'll hear the the drum is kind of up. But then when he starts going, he just goes ape shit <laughs> on, on these crashes. I've never heard this this much crash cymbals on an album. Because he's just doing it just over and over, and it's just amazing. It's not it's not distracting because it's brought down in the mix when he does it. So it's it's not like this out of control that, drummer yeah. that's doing it to showboat. That's that might be um, a lot of drummers from the eighties. Well, before before uh, uh, before they start using electronic drums, that is. Which, uh, but anyway, like <laughs> think of like Stuart Copeland, his first the first couple of albums, the Police did. You know, his drumming was was you know it was pretty much kind of the same way but then when they w- started working with Hugh Padgham everything was kind of pulled back and it was very very light it felt very light on the skins and on the especially on the cymbals and I think that they might be trying to get that same effect here you know he tried mm-hmm. to be, like you say pulling back on the crash you're right he is playing a lot a ton of crash but it yeah. is very I think they just lo- I think they lowered than, that in the production yeah, yeah sure. it, it, he certainly wasn't hitting it lighter because he if you hear he's just I mean, there are sections and 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 measures and bars where he's just mm-hmm. hitting the crash over and over again, but it's not loud and it's not imposing. So I'm thinking that they they mic'd it and just brought it down, which was so smart because it's allowing them the songs to. That's what gives the the songs that punk edge, 
Yeah. But it doesn't give it that punk annoyance, for lack of a better term. Not that punk is annoying, but I get you what, know you're what I'm saying. saying. When, when you're when you're I, yep. trying to produce yep. an album and you're trying to create a sound, right. but still be a little faithful to what you have going on. Go back it's, and listen. It's, everything's where it's supposed to be, and it's in, in all the right spaces. Yeah, and it's meant yeah. to f- either fill or your take away. It's, sometimes it's what you don't play. Yep. But yeah, you're right. It's it's yeah. not obnoxious. It's not overbearing. It's it's there. It's, it's in the yeah. background. And and right. when you listen to it, I'm like, geez, this guy just is. is he's, it's the crash. <laughs> it's the ride, yeah. and it's the fill. Mm-hmm. And he is just all over this album. That's the one thing I love about it is is Clem Burke and Nigel Harrison. And, and Nigel Harrison is is so underrated. But th- this was the album. When we did our top five, this was the this was you know one of the albums that that got me into listening to him and, and listening to the bass and he's just so good but no one's ever heard of him. Sure, yeah. You know they had such a tight okay. band, had such a great lineup here. Yeah, I love it. It is it is very very tight. <laughs> yeah. So then the next song is is All will right. anything happen? Which is which might be the fastest song on the album, which is just mm-hmm. really up tempo, just really blessed. And again, Clem is dr- is driving this with his double. His his double snare and his double like bass drum hit uh, tempo and and his it just kind of drives the song. It gives it that that driving motion, which is really really dig it. Will anything it happen? Was, this wasn't one of the singles though, but it's a song that you heard. I used to hear this a lot on the radio. Yeah, but it wasn't it wasn't a been single. A, might have been a deep cut, you know. So it's a deep cut, a deep but cut. it's def. I definitely heard it on the radio. Like yeah. NEW would play it, and you know. Mm-hmm. Especially yeah. when you know with the chorus is what is how it's familiar. Mm-hmm. And when I revisited it, I was kind of like I didn't get it quite yet. But then when the chorus kicked in, I was like, okay, yeah, yeah I heard I, I've, I've heard this on the radio. I, you know, I bet you if you Google it, I bet you it's been in a commercial. <laughs> I, I guarantee it, it's. I, I have a, it. a sneaking suspicion it, it, it's been used in a commercial. Just that that part, that chorus. Mm-hmm. I guarantee you. And then next up is one of my favorite songs of all time by Blondie, a Sunday Girl. Just a lilting nice mellow again another beautiful performance and if you look at the track listing for the first side hanging on the telephone one way or another it's two really kind of up tempo and, and punky songs and then picture this which is kind of ballady and poppy this is the same thing Eleven fifty nine. will anything happen to up tempo up tempo and then sunday girl mm-hmm. so they kind of they kind of line it up the same way they kind of give you some some quick stuff and then they give you just another great vocal by her. I just, I've, I, lo- I loved this song from when, from when I first heard it. It was just something about the vocal. It was just so like, like kind of innocent or I, I don't know what it was about the vocal, but I just always gravitated towards it. Just always loved this song, Sunday Girl. You know, it just occurred to me that perhaps that's why it's called Parallel Lines. <laughs> oh. You know, because the, the album is so, so even, right? Everything about yeah. it is, is sort of like that right on like even keel yeah you know six singles hats half the album right there three from the first side three from the second right uh, yep. yeah so yeah i think i don't know maybe that's a thing maybe they i don't know if it's okay well it let, let's take let's take that theory one more step then right let's do it <laughs> so <laughs> on side one you had picture this right and then you had fade away and radiate which is kind of an outlier it, it's mm-hmm. not like any other song on that side right it, it's mm-hmm. atmospheric it's moody it's you know got a lot of all that kind of stuff to it right that's right after sunday girl is heart of glass which is a disco song which is not anything that that blondie ever you know they they would do some stuff live they used to do a version of of i feel love by donna summer they used to do that live so they were embracing the whole disco thing um mm. And like I said, Heart of Glass was written in 75 as a reggae reggae tempo song and some other things. And it, it was just kicking around. And then they go to the sessions for Parallel Lines and Mike Chapman's like, what else you got? And they had this song was called Once I Had a Love. And they discoed it up and it became a monster. It absolutely became a monster disco yeah. hit. Did they get some backlash? Absolutely. From, from the punk section of, of music. But you got to remember, you know, they're from New York, New York in 78 and 79. It, it was either punk, new wave, or it was disco. Those were the two, That's right. the two overriding types of music in New York City was, it was Studio 54 or CBGBs, right? If we want to boil it That's down. That's right. No, you're absolutely right. So it's not surprising that they would embrace this. You know, it's not surprising mm-hmm. that they would, they would try it 
And it, it fit them well. <laughs> it fit them all the way to number one, this song. It did because it's disco-y, but it, you know, it definitely has that new wave feel as well. I mean, there's, you could, you know, there's, a little, there's two sides of it, I think. I think the way it's produced, the way, you know, there are certain yeah, things it's to got listen that nice, for. It's got that nice bouncy guitar and it's, so it's got, it's not yeah. total, total disco, but it absolutely has that, that sensibility. And it was made for discos. They just, you know, make the extended remix, remix of this, make it 12 minutes and <laughs> you're going to be on, you're going to be on the dance floor forever with it, <laughs> you know, and, and her vocal is just, oh. yeah. Again, I'm going to say that yeah. on every track. Her, her vocal just, ah, I should just record that and then hit it and just loop it, so I can say. <laughs> but yeah, Heart of, Heart, of, Heart of Glass really put this album into the stratosphere, put them on the map, because then one way or another was the follow-up. And it, and it didn't do as well. It hit number 24, but Heart of Glass was number one, and this song was everywhere back then. Hmm. Um, and that was the thing. I was just sitting in front of, <laughs> sitting with the tape deck, just waiting for it to come on so I can get a good copy of it, you know, without the, without the DJ talking into it. And then oddly enough, the uh, the next song is I'm Gonna Love You Too, which is another, you know, up-tempo, but it's actually a cover of a Buddy Holly song. Yeah. Yeah. Actually written by the Crickets, which was his his backing band. Uh, three guys, three two, two guys from the Crickets and, and then one other guy who was an associate of Buddy Holly's, which I didn't even know. Again, that's that's a straight. I didn't know this was a, a cover and I didn't know it was a cover from way back in the 50s as well. Because they just make it their own. Kind of an odd, just an odd choice. Buddy Holly, <laughs> you know, Robert Fripp. I mean, they're 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 kind of reaching a lot for a lot of different, stepping into a lot of pools here. I think. Yeah. You know, and it's, yeah, it's, it, it's it, interesting. It really is, and you would. And again, it's one of those things when we were kids, we didn't particularly probably didn't notice these kinds of things, but now. Uh, after years of listening to certain bands and that kind of thing, to, for this to be so eclectic like this, it's, yeah. It's, and I've uh, never heard the original. I don't even know what know, the, the the Buddy Holly one sounds like. I, yeah. I should look it up. But that's the thing. A, a lot of in my life, <laughs> mm -hmm. maybe you too, but in my life, oddly enough, a lot of Buddy Holly songs, I was not acquainted with them until I heard someone else do them. I'm talking that's about right. a lot of songs. Like no, you're every, right. You're every, absolutely right. like every day. <laughs> yeah. Every day by. By James Taylor, when when that yeah. came out on, on that's why I'm here. I didn't know that was a Buddy Holly song. Uh, pretty yeah. much, Linda Ronstadt was was owning the the Buddy Holly, Holly catalog. So th there was just a lot of uh, a lot of songs that he had done, and everybody just picked up on. And I had no clue about mm -hmm. "I'm Gonna Love You Too." I could go back. Well, that's a that I don't even think that's not really one of his big hits, was it? No, probably not. I, I, I'd have to go. So obviously, to you know. So it's, a, it's a, to 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 cover a Buddy Holly song and then be, it, it'd be a deep cut of all things. Yeah, is interesting. You know. Yeah, this kind of thing song. Nora Jones would do. Like yeah. she would pick up on a, not not a hit, but something more obscure and more. You know, ah, it's just crazy. It's strange. You know. Yeah. Yeah. More so. More so. Again, from a a band that was riding that that punk new wave. Yeah line right so so but you see where that where the the influences are the influences they are what they are mm -hmm. and they t and artists will take that influence and then put their their stamp on it that's right right yep. just like led yep. zeppelin did with the blues they they took all that stuff they were listening to and they said we're gonna steal it in some cases <laughs> outright and they but they said mm -hmm. we're gonna now put our our sensibilities on it. And this is the same thing as I'm going to love you too, which I had no clue. It's really up tempo. It's really poppy. It's really jumpy, but it's a great song. It's just another one. And then, mm -hmm. and then the final track on the album, oddly enough, it's called just go away. <laughs> Why? Why would you say that on the last, leave on the last track? Get out just of go here. away. Yeah. <laughs> go away. Leave us alone. Yeah. And, and yeah. it's just, again, it closes out the album on a, on a up tempo song. Which again, ninety percent of this album is like that. So if you if you've never heard Parallel Lines, and you only know Heart of Glass, it's not going to be that. But that doesn't mean that you're not going to enjoy it because it's actually better than Heart of Glass. Because because you really got this I tight agree. band. I, I can't say enough about it. Ab yep. About what always mm -hmm. struck me about it and what still continues. I, I try, especially now, trying to pick it apart. You think, oh, you'll have more of a critical ear, and and try and hear something, mm -hmm. and I couldn't. No, it's, it's fresh. It still sounds fresh to me. Yeah. I mean, again, I can, you know, I haven't listened to it in a while, but sure. I mean, you revisit this thing and it's like, it's, it's nice. It's nice to go back to. Yeah. And, and 78. That... And when I think of 78, uh, this was definitely 
to me, it is the album of the of that year. Yeah. Well, I mean, well, seventy eight. That was the start of like the new wave thing was starting to happen. Right? They were they were busy putting out another album earlier in the <laughs> putting out another yeah, album but, earlier in the year. <laughs> but they were definitely you know the band of of that of that period. You know, you think of punk was just starting to die off the the hardcore stuff. I should yeah. say, but then you had the Clash coming in, you had the Police coming in. Yeah, and, and they and, these, and they yeah. were able to ride both, right? Because because yeah. again, that Heart of Glass just kind of put them on a different level. And then the, their next album, Eat to the Beat, would have a song called Atomic on it, which is kind of the same. It's it's kind of like Heart of it's like their disco y song and, mm-hmm. and em, embracing that type of aesthetic. And, and but there's then there's all those other types of songs on there too, like Dreaming and, and Union City Blue, and yeah. classic Blondie sounding stuff. But then Atomic on eat to the beat is the outlier it's 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 like the same thing it's like here's this disco-y track but they're still retaining the mm-hmm. the, the blondie sound on everything else which is just amazing well they and were then, definitely um, keeping in with the times too i mean they you know they were moving you know they knew they kind of instinctively knew what to where to go at least i i feel i don't know yeah well i mean just i mean just I just, whether it was the, pro, you know producers telling him to do so or whatever i i don't i i think for the most part i think debbie harry had a, had a pulse on what was going on out there you know yeah i so, mean like if, again like i said she wasn't afraid to to experiment with disco to experiment with you know she put out that solo record i mean it had a uh what is it uh hr giger cover <laughs> looked like yeah. something from alien and with the you know the talk about the screws in her face and all that kind of thing it was just yeah i mean odd, just ke- keep you know. in mind after after eat to the beat auto american came out in 1980 which would have rapture on it yeah so that and that's like With em- embracing the rap little, genre which was yeah. which which was really in it in 1980 was in its infancy really mm-hmm. so yeah you can you can say that they were a new wave band but they weren't afraid to recognize and embrace these other things and they got a little grief for it but it was it was brilliant on their part because they were able to do it and not sound gimmicky right because when when rapture came out everybody was rapping to that everyone was rapping that middle part and you know it just has that that awesome just that awesome bass line to it it's funky it's jazzy it's it's got everything on it it's it's really great it's inviting it's it's sexy it it it, it draws you in it, it's definitely you walk into a club you walk into like i used to i used to love hearing it in a club or a bar or you know that kind of situation or even in a record store sometimes they would they would be yeah. blasting it and it, yeah it's yeah and then they had the <laughs> tide is go. high from auto american which is kind of reggae-ish and and so they they're certainly not afraid to play with with these mm-hmm. different genres, uh, not not do whole albums based around it, but just say yeah, we, you know we're going to throw something a little different, we're going to try something out because we want to, yeah, you know. So they still mm-hmm. retain the, the 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 Blondie style of of songwriting and music and all that, but then yeah, here's here's some disco for you, and then you know, well, there's there's this rap that we're influenced, we're hearing in New York, uh, this whole rap mm-hmm. scene that's coming out, and let let's do a song with that, and it's just absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. And, and we talked about it a little bit in uh, in our top five bass players one, but Blondie and another tragic band fight in fighting type thing. Uh, unfortunately, you know, they, they would break up in 82. They would reform. I saw them in 2000 and they were really good. It was great. It was like a, you know, a bucket list for me. I was like, yeah, I got to see Blondie and they, and they were great past their prime, but still great. But when they reformed, they did not ask Frank Infante, the, the lead guitarist, and Nigel Harrison, the bass player. They were not invited back. Uh, reasons unknown. I've never been able to find out, like, why those two? Why those two? I, I don't know. And then when they famously, when when the, when Blondie got inducted mm-hmm. into the Hall of Fame, they all got inducted. And then what happens is is the band will play their, you know, after the induction, they'll, they'll play some of their hits. And, and usually that's the time for some heartfelt reunions and some hugging. Um, no, this was yeah. nothing but but animosity. Yep. <laughs> this was animosity. Frank and Fonte and Nigel Harrison were on stage to to accept the award with them and the induction, and they're like, "Well, we're here. You know, we want to play. Uh, let let us play with you." And and Debbie Harris like, "Our our band is here. You know, we we've rehearsed, so it was it was just uncomfortable, unfortunately." But that's uh, a shame. It yeah, is. That's real. That's a it big is. Shame. But I, you know, we don't know what happened. We don't know what what went on. There there had to have been something. Exactly. Um, that precipitated that in, in such a harsh manner too, to not even say, well, for this go around, we'll do it. Mm-hmm. But for parallel lines, they were all there. 
and and that's why that's why this this is the the classic lineup. They went from seventy eight to eighty two, so this is probably the it, you know there was only uh, two albums before this. So for me, this is Blondie. So some people might be purists and say, oh, Greg Valentine, the other yeah. bass player, but nah. When they when they added Jimmy Destry and and added Frank Infante and re, and then got Nigel Harrison in there, it, I think it just changed the whole dynamic of the band. You know, because because I think Nigel mm-hmm. Harrison has some of those those discoy and, and and poppy influences. If you listen to his bass playing, he's just incredible. He he's a match. He I mean he can go toe to toe with Clem Burke. I think this is the album for me for Blondie. I mean I yeah. I do like you know I do like Auto American. There's some really great tracks. Love Do the Dark. Yeah, that, that's but, a great track for me. I love that. I kind of like those like weird kind of slow mm-hmm. noirish kind of stuff. You know that kind of stuff, but. Yeah, this so, one was pu- was punching punching above all the other ones. I think yeah. just mm-hmm. in terms of, in terms of total consistency, even though they do different genres, that doesn't mean the album's inconsistent. And and that's what I love about it. And mm-hmm. again, part of that consistency is being a member of the Clem Burke Appreciation Society. It's just listen to this guy go, just listen to him go nuts on this album. Yeah. It's restra- he's, he's restrained. He's not like Keith Moon, where, where Keith Moon kind of gets a little sloppy well, and gets a little much- out there. Yeah, because you know. he wants to do what he wants to do, and and you know, and in that situation, it's Pete Townsend saying, "Yeah, do whatever the hell you want." I do feel like there, there is. I, I'm sure there's a certain degree of the producer stepping in and saying, "Hey, you know, let's do this and this," and you know, and it's, I'm sure it took quite a bit of time to get that together, considering he thought he was not a good timekeeper. But you know, again, that just blows my mind. But but you're right. It, it, he's just. It, I've never I've never heard really as tight you know even drummers like Stuart copeland likes to do his own thing he's got his own signature style which mm-hmm. is always playing behind the beat you know he yeah. does you know so it, it's it's interesting it's great but it's in in terms of what they're doing here with blondie you know to, to keep that song going and to he, for him to be able to fill yeah, he's got to be at the forefront of it with 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 this type of music with this that's type hard of, to do it's yeah. very hard to do yeah, and with this you type know. of music, when you're doing that new wavy stuff, it's usually it's usually up tempo, fast, fast, fast. Up. So not only is he, is he doing that, but he's throwing in some some fills like like just really, like really fast, and then getting back into it. Really amazing stuff. Uh, all the musicians yeah. are can't shortchange Chris Stein, can't, can't shortchange Frank and Fonte, and Jimmy Destry, who is this who who's the only is the keyboard player. So when you're talking about the programming and 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 the sound of of heart of glass that that's that's where jimmy destry comes in and he comes in on those types of things and yeah and and like fade away and radiate it's got that really weird synthy stuff and uh you know it, he it, it everybody mm-hmm. has a role to play but clem burke is my favorite mm-hmm. and, and nigel harrison sorry but they're they're really good so if you if you if you, if you want to hear what, what we're talking about go check that out and, and really just isolate on the drums and you'll just be you'll be blown away absolutely a favorite among favorites. This is absolutely yeah, one absolutely. of mine. Like I said, it's, it's yep. a foundation. It's a foundation. Mm-hmm. And, and Debbie Harry would, would go on to acting mm-hmm. as well after Blondie would break up. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tales from the Dark Side, the movie, a uh, movie called Videodrome. Videodrome. Dave, David Cronenberg. Boy, she, was a, in, she was in Copland. That's a, <laughs> she was in Copland. She, a lot of yeah. her scenes were cut out, but that's she was right. in Copland with, uh, um, mm-hmm. with De Niro. And that was uh, James Mangold's one of, uh, that was his second film, I think. Um, so yeah, so she she kept she's kept busy, and then and then Blondie reformed in, in the two thousands, and they've been very prolific. They put out a couple of albums after that too, so they've been prolific and they've been touring. So they've been absolutely out there keeping it going, and and I'm glad for that because people get to mm-hmm. the more people get to hear hear this kind of stuff, and then go back and listen to the album and hear how just how in the zone Blondie was on this album. They really figured it out, and getting the right person to help them with it was was key. And and kind of taming that's what it is, is kind of mm-hmm. taming their sound and, and getting a little more under control while still retaining those those new wavy sensibilities. Yeah. That's it. That's it in a nutshell. No, I totally agree. It's yep, yeah, that's that, that, that definitely it. <laughs> Not more to say. <laughs> <laughs> well then so there it you is. know what? That that's that's gonna do it for us. This is one one of my favorites, absolutely. Like I said, it was it was when we were making our list of what we wanted to talk about, like parallel lines was was absolutely right on there because it was one of the first ones as a child i listened to so it's always got a special place in my heart mm-hmm. uh, as, as always we thank you for for joining us we appreciate the support you can find us on instagram and facebook 3324 podcast as always uh thank you uh for eric this has been dean mm-hmm. and we will see you on the flip side 
You've been listening to the 3324 Podcast with Dean Legiro and Eric Cooper. You can find us on your favorite podcast provider. So please like, subscribe, and rate to become a part of the 3324 family. Your feedback is important, so make sure to follow us on Instagram and Facebook at 3324podcast and on Twitter at 3324p to join the conversation. 